Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started. We have a number of people online. Uh, I see that you're uh, muted. That's great. Uh, if you do get a chance toward the end to ask questions, uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, but uh, please keep yourself muted as much as possible. Thank everyone for uh, being here for our first uh, public health seminar series for this year. Uh, we record these and we eventually post them on the uh, uh, public health website, uh, nymc.edu slash public health. And you just click the seminars and you can hear the whole things uh, or hear the whole video at that time. Uh, I'm thrilled that we're introducing our first speaker. Uh, as you know, uh, Ben Watson stepped down in sometime late May, early June and we had a search, a national search for to replace him, the vice dean. And one of the requirements is that people with names Ben's could only apply. So <laughs> just made it a lot easier. But uh, Ben Johnson uh, came up from Kentucky. He has a, 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 a background where he had spent years here in New York uh, and he went to the Midwest and has now kind of migrated back to this area. He's the vice dean and he really came in at an interesting opportunity, an interesting time because uh, there was absolutely no uh, no phase in at this point. He took hit the road running because of the dean being out for so long with his injury. So uh, I'm I'm thrilled that uh, Dr. Johnson's here. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the relationship of uh, disabilities and muscular uh, skeletal injuries. Something I think is a passion of his, and I think it's something that we should be looking at, perhaps. Uh, possibly uh, investigating as potential tr uh, training uh, programs for, uh, for uh, our school. So with that in mind, Ben Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I'm a little disadvantaged today. I got so accustomed to the summer dress code that I don't think, nor do I speak as well with a jacket and particularly a tie on. And my other excuse is I had a great Labor Day holiday I drove 1,600 miles over the short holiday. I went from here to Kentucky, from Kentucky to North Carolina, the coast of North Carolina, and then not to the beach, but to see my mother, and then from there back to here. So I got in last night at about 10 o'clock. So I'm a little bit still driving my truck. And anyway, so you'll forgive me if I'm uh, if I'm if I'm having a, a bit of a difficult time at, at times today. But seriously. Um, I'm very pleased to be here at New York Medical College and bring my various experiences uh, to the institution. Um, I have come up from more of an exercise science kinesiology background, and I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, certainly have had significant interface in the health sciences, given that my area of expertise is biomechanics. I've been a faculty member in physical therapy at, uh, at Georgia State University and have worked in the College of Health and Human Services at, at another university. So I've had a lot of, of experiences in that area. Um, I'm going to talk about two areas in which I've had quite a lot of experience during my career. One is in international disability rights. And you might question where does that come into play with somebody with a physics and engineering and technology sort of background, but I think I'll be able to connect those dots for you. And then of course, uh, the area of, of applied biomechanics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I got to workplace injury, um, where, whereas I started out with an interest in sport. Now this little contraption they gave me, they tell me looks like it's backwards. So hopefully I'll push the buttons correctly here. So my background, I got my doctorate from the University of Kentucky in biomechanics back in 1980 and um, took a faculty job, my first faculty job at Georgia State University where I was an assistant professor and director of the first sports medicine program and then later the, the biomechanics and ergonomics laboratory. I worked at Georgia State for about 21, 22 years and um, left that position to take the job of associate dean in the College of Health and Human Services at Kennesaw State University, a sister institution in the university system of Georgia. I was primarily involved with uh, community outreach programs and international um, uh, global opportunities. Um, the accreditation group for Kennesaw State was SACS, the Southern Association here in Middle States, of course. 
And the focus of their um, accreditation process that year was in globalizing the campus. And so it was my role to assist the faculty and students in our particular college at Kennesaw State to uh, become more globally aware. And I'll sort of give you some feedback as to how I got to that particular point. I was able to retire with full benefits from the University System of Georgia in 2011. And much to the chagrin of our children, followed them from Georgia to New York City where they had come to go to school. We lived in Snellville, Georgia. And when they came to, to New York, they declared they would never ever move back to Snellville. So we showed them, we moved to New York. So I was department chair at uh, City University of New York, Brooklyn College for four years and was quite happy in that position and probably would have still been there. Um, but my alma mater, my doctoral alma mater, University of Kentucky came calling with a department chair's position and they made an offer that I couldn't refuse. And so I uh, made the uh, decision to, to go back to UK. Um, that was an interesting experience um, for a variety of reasons. We were very interested in coming back to New York. Some were political, <laughs> some were diversity related, others were a variety of things, but we were very pleased that an opportunity presented itself here at New York Medical College and particularly the School of Health Sciences and Practice. So what is my ultimate message today? Well, I see mostly in the room today, older people, faculty, you know, you've kind of come and gone in, in many regards, I'm sorry. This message is for the students, but I hope that you faculty will be able to echo for the students, perhaps your experiences here. So the intersection of these seemingly disparate areas, international human rights and workplace injuries, how do those connect? Well, the message here is to be ready when opportunities present themselves. So back to my background briefly, I was a baseball player in college. I wanted to be a college coach. So I decided that in order to be a college baseball coach, I needed to have a, a master's degree. So I went to get a master's degree and I got introduced to the sciences. And then it quickly evolved into, well, gosh, I could be a high tech coach using all of this technology that I've begun, begun to use. And I don't have to spend all the hours on the field that coaches do. And I saw how professors work and I thought, man, that'd be a pretty cool profession. So I set my sights on not just being a biomechanics person, but being somebody who involves themselves with the technology that was pushing that particular science forward. So I changed the trajectory from wanting to be a college baseball coach to wanting to be a college professor. That then led me to UK where I studied for my doctorate in biomechanics. My professor at UK won the silver medal in the 1972 Olympic games in the 400 meter hurdles. He was the best hurdler in the world for a long time. We had many opportunities to do sport related biomechanics. That was why I chose UK was because of sport biomechanics. And so almost all of the projects that I did related to sport and performance. We looked at injuries. We had some opportunities to do some investigations on uh, head and neck injuries associated with football and football tackling and the issues of helmets. Being in Kentucky, we had opportunities to do biomechanical analyses of thoroughbred racehorses. That was a really interesting experience. So I graduate, I take a job in Georgia and I began building my career around sport related biomechanics. Started a lab with a focus on that. Um, in 1990, Atlanta was awarded the Olympic Games for 1996. So as the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games began flushing out its staffing, uh, they identified that through the International Olympic Committee's Medical Commission that they needed to do research projects during the 96 Games. Just prior to that, because Georgia State at that time not being a terribly um, well-funded institution was having difficulties providing for me lab space and equipment, things we can all relate to here. And so there was a, a gentleman that had helped me to 
secure a, an, an international um, experience working with the Korean Olympic Committee back in 1983, who had moved from the U.S. Olympic Training Center uh, in Colorado Springs to Birmingham, where he was working with Dr. William Andrews, one of the leading orthopedic surgeons in the country that did a lot of particularly shoulder uh, surgeries for, for baseball players. So I knew Dr. Dillman was in Birmingham. It was only a two and a half hour drive from Atlanta. I drove over and said, hey, Dr. Dillman, you remember me? I'd love to be able to help with some of the research that you do. Might we be able to collaborate? And he's talked about a variety of things we could do. Well, that was in probably middle 1989. Dr. Dillman got a call in late night in, uh, in, in towards the end of 1990 and said, uh, said, we'd like for you to coordinate the research projects for the Atlanta games. He says, I'm not interested. I've been there. I've done that, but I know somebody that would. So he called me up, said, would you be interested? Absolutely. So in 1990, I was named the research director for the 96 Olympic games, simply because I took the opportunity to go and, rekindle my relationship with Dr. Chuck Dillman, one of the leading orthopedic, one of the leading biomechanists in the country, working with one of the leading orthopedic surgeons in the country. Had I not taken that opportunity to drive those two and a half hours and talk about collaborations, that opportunity would have never, ever presented itself. From that time forward, I had only traveled to South Korea and spent six months there back in 1983 as a doctoral student. From 1990 till today, I've probably traveled to 40 or 50 countries. I've worked in at least 30 or 40 of those countries, some more extensively than others. And it all goes back to having visited Birmingham and made that, that connection with Dr. Dillman. Well, I won't go through all the details of the Olympic Games, but obviously I made a lot of connections during those games. We did 22 research projects across a variety of sports. We had cameras all over the, the city recording athlete performances. And for about a period of 10 years, I followed up on all those projects and made sure they all got published and, and things of that nature. So created some real strong relationships. Well, after the 96 Games, um, and, and, the, and let me back up. Following those games were the Paralympic Games, the games for people with physical disabilities, basically the Olympics, but for people with disabilities. That followed the Atlanta Games by about a two week period. Nowadays, without burdening you with too much detail, those games are married together. If a, if a city uh, applies for um, hosting the games, they're agreeing that they're going to host both the Olympic and the Paralympic Games. And that has been a real boon for the Paralympic movement because the IOC has more money than God. <laughs> anyway, the connection there is that in um, 1999, um, I met this lady that was a, one of our faculty members and we ended up getting married, but she was the technical officer <laughs> of the International Paralympic Committee. She was the most powerful American, I think maybe that's what attracted me to her. She was the most powerful American in the international disability sport movement. And for you ladies in the room, she was the most powerful woman in sport, maybe in the entire world for that period of time because she was leading the sport mo movement of the Paralympic Committee. Well, I had all the, Olympic connections, she had all the Paralympic connections. Her connections were probably much deeper and stronger than mine. So let me jettison forward. In, on September 11th, 2001, obviously we all know what happened. Shortly thereafter, the Bush administration decided that the best way, one of the best ways to connect Americans with people around the world in a way that was non-threatening, where we could maybe have better communications was to use sport as a means of connecting to people that we particularly wanted to connect to. And in this particular case, the target was with Muslim countries with which we seem to be having some great difficulty politically. So in 2001, they put out their first round of proposals for the International Sport Programming Initiative. The idea was that Americans would work with individuals from various countries and there, were, there was a target list of countries. And the goal was to create lines of communication. 
So we went and met with the program officer to make sure we knew what was going on with their program and their funding and kind of got the scope of, of things. We went to our partner for that particular project, who was the vice president of the International Paralympic Committee based in Cairo, Egypt. And he said, here's what we should do. We should do a workshop based in Cairo. Um, even though you're only funded for our country, we will invite the entire continent of Africa to come to this particular workshop. You can train coaches, sport managers, medical personnel, rehabilitation specialists, et cetera. And, um, and we'll then do some sort of sport festival uh, on, on top of that. And so we did. So we took a group of our faculty members and some of our students from Georgia State University at the time to Cairo. We trained about 120 professionals from the entire continent of Africa. We had more than half of the countries represented. Um, we did five days of intense education on issues of sports medicine, rehabilitation, sport management, media, the whole nine yards, everything that people would need to know about sport. So I was the expert in the sport side of things. I was able to put together the program that needed to be done from a sports science, sports medicine perspective. And Carol, my wife, who was the co-director of the project, had all the, the knowledge in the areas of disability. So I came in it, I came into it from that coaching and sport perspective that I had been carrying along, and she came into it with her human rights, disability rights, and Paralympic sports stuff. Well, we created relationships that I maintain to today. So anytime there's a call for proposals from the Department of State under this program, which continues, we know who our partners already are if, if we're targeting Africa. We've been funded now eight or nine times under that program to the tune of $5 million. So this was an opportunity that did not in any way fit with my lab-based biomechanics research, but it was something that I was very interested in from a knowledge perspective. I certainly grew to understand and, and more fully appreciate the issues of human rights from the perspective of people with physical disabilities and have been able to keep, to keep that program going for quite some time. So this was some of our motivation for why this program might work. Um, the World Health Organization in talking about its global disability action plan for the period 2014 to 2021 revealed that about 15% of the world's population has a disability, 15% of the population. And it's more extensive in developing countries, particularly, and that um, one in 20 children under 15 years of age, age lives with a permanent to a moderate severe disability. I spent weeks and weeks and weeks in Cairo, a city of almost 20 million people. We drove all over that city, and that's a challenge to do if you've ever been to Cairo. I hardly ever saw a person with a disability. They were seemingly non-existent, but they were there. 15 to 20% of that population had a disability of some sort. So where were they? Well, we saw them when we did our workshop. We saw them when we did our sports festival, but they weren't out mingling in society. So there are all kinds of environmental barriers. There are all kinds of transportation issues. There are all kinds of stigmas associated with people with disabilities. And so, that was when it started sort of ringing true to me. I understood it from the Paralympic sport perspective, but when I thought about how it could affect society more broadly, that was the, the thing that hammered it home. And Cairo is well developed compared to some of the other countries in Africa, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. More recently, we've done a lot of work in South Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania. And so the needs there we found to be even higher. I'm not gonna read the rest of those stats to you there, but obviously you can, you can look at them for yourself. The message in the remainder of that slide is that those percentages increase rather significantly when you look at people from developing countries, when you look at people from lower socioeconomic uh, groups and women. John Kerry said back in 2012 regarding the Human Rights Report, anywhere that human rights are under threat, the United States will proudly stand up 
unabashedly and continue to promote greater freedom, greater openness, and greater opportunity for all people. And that means speaking up when those rights are imperiled. It means providing support and training to those who are risking their lives every day so that their children can enjoy more freedom. It means engaging governments at the highest levels and pushing them to live up to their obligations to do right by their people. God, I hope we continue to do that. We certainly aren't doing it right now, but we'll get back to the important mission that the Department of State has so eloquently set out. In, 24, or in 20, uh, 2009, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton said, our principles are our North Star, but our tools and tactics must be flexible and reflect the reality on the ground wherever we are trying to have a positive impact. Our approach is that we support change driven by citizens and their communities. The project of making human rights a human reality cannot be just one for governments. It requires cooperation among individuals in organizations within communities and across borders. It means that we work with others who share our commitment to securing lives of dignity for all who share the bonds of humanity. So various other organizations have made statements about the importance of human rights. They have included people with disabilities in those um, statements they've made. They've indicated the importance of being able to access um, various aspects of, of, of the, the, the normal society, transportation, et cetera, but that recreation and physical activity should be a part of that. So when we started to reflect on all of those needs and how we could be impactful to society in general, working with our local partners, you know, it, it just became more and more apparent that sport had a role to play. So sport is very powerful. Sport is a true and a proven transformative possibilities. If you approach it properly, it can transform people and society. So the message here is that sport has the opportunity to reach more people than almost any other activity available. More people engage in, watch in, participate in, enjoy sport more than any other activity that we can name. It goes back to the 70s and Nixon with ping pong diplomacy. He opened the doors to China with ping pong, table tennis. And so I'm sure that had to be the, the idea that the, the Bush administration was trying to play off of in terms of how they could use sport. So for the longest of times, Carol and I were the only individuals that were promoting disability sport. One of the reasons I suppose we got funded so many times until somebody else realized, whoo, there must be something about this disability sport thing. And so we started getting a little bit more competition. So the funding is not guaranteed anymore, but we, we took it for a very, very long ride. So that was an opportunity that we pursued, not just because it was funding, but it was something that was important to us individually and to us collectively. And we were able to engage our <laughs> networks, mine on the Olympic side, Carol's on the Paralympic side, and utilize the faculty that we had with us at that time at Georgia State and later at other institutions to really and truly make a difference in the lives of people. Our approach was that we would share the message and there were lots of messages and, and they were tailored to the group that we worked with. We would provide the experiences for the group and we would create the opportunities. So the message was, we can help you to build your Paralympic committee and your Paralympic program in your country, but at the same time, we can influence your government leaders, whether they're national, uh, regional, or local, into better understanding what your needs are, but also what your needs are outside of sport, because you've got to have transportation. You've got to have access to, to, to medical doctors. One of the things that really hammered home to me the concept of the importance of physical activity for people with physical disabilities was when our Egyptian partner, Dr. Nabil Salam, who was a, an orthopedist said, and he had been working as an orthopedist for at that time about 30 years, said, do you realize that a person with a spinal cord injury in Egypt is highly, highly unlikely to get any sort of meaningful rehabilitation post-injury. Approximately 2% of people with spinal cord injuries at that time, this was 2002, 
about 2% got access to rehabil meaningful rehabilitation, 2%. Probably even worse in Sub-Saharan Africa. Shweb Chalkin, who was uh, a human rights leader in South Africa, said that one of the leading causes of death, if not the leading cause of death for a South African with a new spinal cord injury is death from infection, from bed sores or sores acquired from the wheelchair that's ill-fitting that they use. Infection. So that to me was very alarming. We provide the experience. We, would, we always did a workshop. We always did a sports festival, which was where, wherein we invited people from the community, both with and without disability, but particularly children from the community to come and learn about Paralympic sport. It gave the opportunity for those that we educated in the workshop to get some hands-on experience. And it gave them a fun day. But what was really critically important early on in our projects with the sports festival was that it attracted media. Newspapers, television would come and they'd take video and they would take photos and they'd write articles. And the word would get out that, hey, look, People with physical disabilities can actually do stuff. They're actually capable of doing things physically. And that then shed some light on what people with physical disabilities are capable of. In other words, disability is not inability. And we needed to help show what their abilities were. And then we create the opportunities. We try to create opportunities for emerging leaders to rise up within their country to leadership roles or uh, in, in law and in, 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 um, supporting the rights of people with disabilities from a, from a political and, and a legal perspective with media and being able to get the word out and in many other ways. We would always bring a group back to the United States where they would get more intensive training and to see how Americans approach the notion of disability. Judy Human, um, who under um, Obama was the primary um, um, advisor to the president and to the Secretary of State on the issues of disability, said back around the 96 games time that sport gives disabled youth an opportunity to see people like themselves excel. It inspires disabled young people to believe that with hard work and talent, they can excel in their own chosen fields, just like the athletes excel in theirs. Most important, the Paralympics encourage the parents and families of disabled people to have high expectations for them. When kids with disabilities who otherwise have few opportunities to participate in things like sports, see other people like them performing to very high levels, um, it, it, it's very inspiring for them. In the 2000 games, I worked for NBC on their website. Um, I was the sports science analysts for them. And they were looking for sort of human interest sorts of stories that they could sort of splash in at various times during the games. And I said, hey, you know, they do Paralympic demonstration events during the Olympic games. We should do a comparison of the 800 meters and the 1500 meter wheelchair racers and the 800 meter and 1500 meter runners. And so I can give you some biomechanical data about how those two races compare. And do you know that if they had been running head to head or rolling head to head, the, the wheelchair athletes would have won both the 800 and the 1500 meters because their wheelchairs had lesser time to complete the races than did the runners. Mary Robinson, who was the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, also stated about sport, the importance for women and girls. A lot of our work was in the um, Middle East, where women and girls had fewer opportunities for participation in sport uh, than did men. And so Mary Robinson said, the question of women in sport is not only a sport issue, it is a matter which goes beyond the structure of sport organizations and the facilities available. Women's participation in sport is by essence deeply rooted in the human rights context. The development of women's sport is therefore one aspect of a more general social and cultural evolution, which provides increased recognition of women's roles and needs in society alongside with the roles and needs of men. 
that promotion of sport and physical education for girls and women is recommended as an important tool to eliminate socially constructed gender stereotypes. We've come a long way since Mary Robinson made this statement, but there's still significant bias and exclusion around women and girls in the United States, but certainly globally. So not only did our projects target people with disabilities, we also targeted women and girls, and particularly women and girls with disabilities. We always required that for any participation in our projects, that some substantial portion of the participants must be women with disabilities. So if there was a group coming to the United States, it had to be 50% women. That was very upsetting to some of the leadership and some of those kind. Of, we can't find a woman with a disability. Certainly you can find a woman with a disability. We can't find a woman who's involved with sport. Certainly you can find a woman who wants to be involved with sport and maybe you could provide an opportunity for her. So it really did start to make changes. And this is why we did it. These are our Salvation Army kids from Tanzania. And this is a small subsampling. There are hundreds of them with various disabilities. This is at our um, sports festival day in Dar es Salaam back in, I guess it was 2016. So almost any disability you can think of is represented among that group. When we did our first project in Atlanta back in 2002, we created what was known as the African Academy for Disability Sport. And so we've done about eight or nine academies uh, over that time period. So this was, this was the last of those that we have done. So here's a sampling of the group in Tanzania that was involved in our workshop in this particular project. We had a group, a larger group of Tanzanians and a group of 30 Kenyans that we brought over uh, to Dar es Salaam for the purposes of training. We gave them three full days of workshop training in a variety of areas. We were funded by the Department of State. So in every country in which we work, there is a, um, an embassy. And so we always invite the ambassador to come and participate in our project. And more times than not, the ambassador is not available. We have had the ambassadors visit a couple of times, Morocco in particular. But we got the second in charge, the chef de mission, uh, and I'm forgetting her name at the moment, but she came out for a visit and mingled with the crowd. Um, met a lot of the, uh, the, the coaches and sport managers, etc. cetera. Uh, this gentleman here, Guakiza uh, Makabeta, is the president of the Tanzanian Paralympic Committee. We went through the requisite sort of posing things, kicking soccer balls, because there were video cameras there from the local news. There were photographs, there were photographers there, and there were reporters there. So we, we did our whole dog and pony show with the embassy there. We got various posed shots. And this was the result. We got some good coverage on the newspapers. And believe me, you rarely ever see anything in a newspaper in Tanzania about, in a positive way, about people with disabilities. So President Mwakabeta was quite happy with the exposure that they received. These are a couple of our uh, participants um, where we're teaching them about shot putting. Um, the lady on the left is, um, has a visual impairment gentleman on the right has uh, polio. And this guy is a superstar. He was probably our best emerging leader. I'm, in fact, I can't even call him an emerging leader. He was a leader in his own right. He's from a very remote area of Kenya. He went back and took what he learned and he has a gangbuster program going and he is bugging me every week. Can I bring some people over to the United States? And I've had to put him off twice in Kentucky because of the timing with which he wanted to come. But I promised him that when I came to New York, we would get he and his group here. So at some point, I hope in the very near future, we're going to be able to host uh, Bernard Ngondo's group from Kenya and uh, give them some in further insights into what we do in the United States. Everybody finished with a certificate. And um, on the right here, you can see that's the group that we brought to UK for some training. Um, here again are some of our participants uh, from the Salvation Army group. We had about 750 people participating in our uh, sports festival that day. 
this young, young man is obviously albino, has some visual issues associated with, that, with his albinism. Do you realize that in Tanzania today that children with albinism are oftentimes sacrificed because they believe that um, there are some powers associated with um, their tissues that can help in some regard. So uh, there's a major funding initiative uh, going on right now through the United States to uh, have a positive impact on um, the perspectives, the, the old wives' tales, et cetera, around albinism in countries across Africa, but particularly in Tanzania. So I'm standing out watching the festival and the guy that runs the park we were at walks over and says, I've got a special treat for you. I said, how could, how could it get any better? He said, just wait. The seven foot three Tanzanian comes walking through the gate and I'm like, who is that? And I'm, let's see, his name is, uh, I'm gonna forget his name now. His last name is Tabit. He played basketball for UConn. He was the number two selection in the NBA draft a few years ago. Um, by far the tallest Tanzanian you're ever going to see. Um, he had just got cut from his team, so he had some time on his hands. But he was the rock star. You know, standing beside somebody seven foot three, I, I felt quite small. But he made an appearance, and believe me, the media followed him to that. So it, that was really quite an unexpected privilege to have him there. You can see he kind of stands out from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the transition? Where, so where does this workplace injury thing fit in? Well, again, I went to Georgia State University with the intention of having the best sport biomechanics research program that you could ever possibly have. And I set upon doing that as fast as I could with the limited, limited resources provided. And then one day I get a phone call and it's an attorney for a local law firm and said, I need a biomechanics consultant. Can you help me? It's a railroad related injury. I know nothing about a railroad injury. How did you get my name? One of our students was doing his internship in their fitness center in the building in which his office was located. The kid was personally training the attorney and the attorney just happened to say, hey, do you know anybody with a biomechanics background? <laughs> oh yeah, you need to call Dr. Johnson because he had just finished taking my class. So I went over and met with the attorney and the case was a 27 year old railroad worker who was just out of the military, was still very active as a hunter and a marathoner. He was working on a November evening. He was riding on the back of a train as they were backing in some cars into a cement factory area where there was sand all over the tracks. They loaded sand into the cars there. So as the cars were being pushed in, he was sort of holding himself onto the rungs of the ladder on the back of the vehicle and he had a, um, a lantern in one hand and he had his microphone here and he was talking to the engineer who was backing the train in. The train ran up on sand and sort of lurched and his feet slipped from the bottom rung and it trapezed him under the train, which continued to roll and cut off two legs and an arm. And so my job should I have been willing to accept, was to recreate that, to explain from a biomechanical perspective how all of that could have happened because he couldn't really tell us other than what I just told you. This is what I was doing and then I woke up and I was being put in an ambulance and I was missing my legs and, and one of my arms. And so I had to go back and recreate that and describe biomechanically how all those things could happen. I was very pleased with myself at the end. You know, I did a pretty good job, I thought. Didn't think anything of it. And suddenly, I got another call. I've got a problem with a guy who's throwing the switches, the switches that divert the cars onto different. Um, he, he hurt his shoulder, and he's suing CSX or whatever the, the, the various train companies were. Can you explain how 
if he does this enough, the, 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 of course I can. And then I got another call. And then I got a call from another attorney. And then I got a call from another attorney. And then I got a call from another attorney. And suddenly I was going all over the country as an expert in railroad injuries. I'd never studied a railroad in my life. But I probably have had, and I don't do it much anymore. It's not as big an industry as it once was. I probably had 60 or 70 cases since 96 or 97 when I had my first case. So I never envisioned myself being an ergonomist or working in workplace injuries, but I quickly realized that there was a huge area within biomechanics for this. And then lo and behold, a couple of years after I did my first couple of cases, I went to an American College of Sports Medicine meeting and um, Dick Nelson, who was the, one of the fathers of biomechanics in this country from Penn State University, was doing a full session on forensic biomechanics using biomechanics and workplace related issues, et cetera. So uh, whether it was um, railroad cases or other repetitive motion injury cases, carpal tunnel syndrome, head injuries, you, know, you name it. So it's a very burgeoning area. And we that came more or less from the sport world were the leaders in that early on. And then those darn biomedical engineers started figuring it out. They started edging us out. Maybe that's why I'm not working quite as much. So I couldn't call myself a biomedic or a biomechanics engineer. I had to call myself a biomechanist. And so one of my biomechanics competitors in the case said, what's a biomechanist? I've never heard of a biomechanist. So we're not certified in here. But we will. So again, opportunity. I took my biomechanics, albeit in an, an entirely different area, but the concepts applied and I was able to use it and as a consequence have had a very fruitful consulting career in that particular regard. So that's the intersection of those two areas. I didn't envision myself in school doing either one of these things, but when the opportunities came along, I was ready and prepared to do that. So always be prepared to pursue areas that, that fall in your lap. And in the case of the, the first, we've made, we've trained hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And when you think about the, the, the training of trainers and the multiplication effect of that, perhaps we've influenced thousands of kids' lives in, in Africa as a result and other places as well. And in the case of the, 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 the ergonomics, I made a good amount of money doing it, but also helped a lot of people that were in pretty dire situations with injuries that were not going to allow them to get back to work, even though they were fairly young, um, physically capable in, in other areas. So I didn't talk a lot about research, but I did talk a little bit about sort of opportunities where you can apply your expertise. So I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Maybe I can be more detailed if you have specific research questions. I assume people can ask questions online too. Yes. Uh, I have a question about um, the uh, Paralympics. Mm -hmm. Well, repeat that for people online. So the question is, how does how does somebody qualify to be a to be a Paralympian? Well, first of all, they have to be a, an elite level athlete. Um, their disability is defined by the the groups that oversee the the, the sporting areas in which their disability might fit. Um, so it's got to be a verifiable physical disability. And in some cases, there are varying grades of disability associated with, um, with injury or with um, um, neurological disorders, et cetera. So sometimes there will be a medical group that will assess what their level of ability is and they'll be categorized. So it's sort of similar to weight classes in wrestling or boxing um, because they want to as much as they possibly can, even the field for the competition so that those that are the better trained athletes are the ones that are able to win the medals. So they're not gaining an advantage of having less disability. So. I think that, um, I think in the last summer Paralympic games, they had about 4,000 athletes competing across all the various sports. The Olympic games typically have around nine to 10,000 athletes. Across all the sports. 
Yes. What's your favorite Paralympic sport to watch? <laughs> well, that's a hard one. Um, it's either um, wheelchair rugby or ice sledge hockey. They're, they're both contact sports. The wheelchair rugby are, are primarily quadriplegic, so they have limited function in their arms and hands, and they basically sort of pass, they can pass the ball to each other, but they have to cross a goal line. Um, I was at the gold medal game in Sydney, Australia, um, when the U.S. was playing Australia for the, for the gold medal, and there were these two hunks on the court that just were like two rams or two bulls. They backed off from each other and just went at, went at it and had the collision of a lifetime. And they just went flying through there. So they're all over the place. And then ice ledge hockey is just like hockey, except they're sitting down, rolling around, or sliding around on their hands. So they're propelling themselves with their arms. Um, great sports. It takes almost 10 days to run the track and field competition during the Paralympic Games because they have so many different classification sets. So it's, he, he's, he's, not a, he's not somebody we, we revel in anymore, but at one time Oscar Pistorius from South Africa, you know, was thrown in jail for murder. Uh, he was a great kid until he was not a great kid. Um, he competed very, very favorably with Olympic athletes. In fact, he was told he could not participate against able-bodied athletes because he had an advantage. And I'm thinking to myself, how the hell could he have an advantage over somebody with fully, a fully functioning body? And one of the guys that did research during the, the 96 games that I got to be very good friends with did the research that got him kicked out. But he was given a very narrow window in which he could do his research. We want you to do this, this, and this. So it was only one step onto the ground where they could measure his velocities and accelerations and forces. Had nothing to do with a start or running a curve. And so he appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport and they overruled the, the, the IAAF who said that he does not have an advantage. So he did compete in the Olympic Games. He did not win a medal, but he did compete very favorably. And that got a lot of great coverage. Absolutely. For the, uh... Uh, disability, you know, the, uh, the next two weeks later when we had the, uh, uh, the Paralympics. Yeah, that his, his rise to fame did more for the Paralympic movement than all of the years where they did the demonstration sports during the Olympic Games with the 1500 meter and 800 meter wheelchair races. No question about it. So it was really disheartening that, that Oscar had the issues that he had um, that really set Paralympic sport back significantly. You had mentioned uh, individuals with neurological disorders. Which mm -hmm. ones did you include? Uh, you name it, it's there. There are significant um, participation of people with, with cerebral palsy. Um, that's probably the most prevalent. I was wondering about individuals with co occurring cognitive problems like a traumatic brain injury. There are limited participants in the Paralympic Games for cognitive disability. Those are, will be primarily in the Special Olympics. Um, so if the, if the cognitive disability has some sort of impact physically, yes. The primary sport in which people with cognitive disabilities participate in the Paralympic Games is rowing. Yes, because in primarily in, um, in, in more of a team competition, so four people in the boat, so two people with a cognitive disability, two people without a cognitive disability, but with a physical disability. So that was a very successful model, and it may have evolved since that time. Um, I, was on the, uh, I was on the rowing committee that sort of helped facilitate that, and it was really quite interesting to watch the, the process. I, I used to row competitively masters, and I'm trying to picture it. it. Believe me, it created some problems. There, yeah. there were some real issues. I, I, I went and did a lot of research on what were the physical consequences of the cognitive impairment. And so it was things like cadence, yep. which is critically important when you're in a, in a team situation. If the, if the paddles hit the boards, hit the water at different times, it can just throw the whole dynamics of the boat off. So that was really one of the big challenges. Things that a lot of people never would, normal people would never think of. So. Thank you very much, sir, for 
everything you did. Probably <coughs> you, you won't even know how many people you're going to influence in Africa, especially, I mean, uh, uh, handicapped people. Yes. Uh, somebody who's originally from Senegal, I know the stigma, yeah. you know, uh, on those people. How about in those children? You think, and you mentioned they use them for sacrifices in some areas like yes. Mali, Burkina Faso, and yeah. I know the yeah. fact. In Senegal, actually, it's not too too bad, and right now they're trying to insert like the uh, handicapped uh, people in uh, in many companies. Yes. Some companies even they just hire handicapped people mm -hmm. to do certain jobs. But I didn't think about sport. Yeah. And actually, I have two friends in the current government. Maybe I it's just an inspiration, you know, to write to them. Think about you know uh, involving those kids you know in sport. Who knows? Maybe in ten years you're gonna have somebody in the Olympics. <laughs> I, I would suggest that you ask them to go to the local American embassy and to interface with the cultural division of the embassy about a program or a project because oftentimes the cultural um, attaches will take on small projects where they could bring in somebody from the U.S. to do some workshops with them. So they do have small grant funding that are in country. Talk about some degrees besides biomechanics that we can look at. I know there are universities that have rehabilitation services, rehabilitation degrees. Talk a little bit about that and how you think it might possibly fit into our, our, our possibilities here. Well, one of the things I talked about during my interview process was rehabilitation sciences, because that can cross over into all the areas within the school, um, and it can combine uh, a host of, of, of expertise. So my closest relationship to that would be mostly from a physical therapy perspective and understanding from a physical therapy perspective how for musculoskeletal injury or for performance for some one with a disability, how that fits in. So understanding the science side of things as well as some of the therapeutic sides of things. But more importantly, being able to do research that relates to the effectiveness of a particular therapeutic modality or a therapeutic approach. Um, certainly speech language can, can, can bring their expertise to that. We can certainly talk about it from a public health perspective because this is a public health related issue. You know, it's workplace injuries are, are not going to go away. And the more we can do to, to minimize the effects of that, you know, and when humans interface with things on railroads, none of which are lightweight, you know, injuries are going to occur. Some are acute uh, types of injuries and others are overuse uh, types of injuries. Most of the things I saw were overuse related. Rarely was it an acute situation other than that first example that I, that I, I, I described to you. Uh, but when you've done a job repeatedly, I mean, one of my last consulting jobs was that of a gentleman in his late fifties who was literally dismantling a bridge and uh, over a, a a big crevasse in West Virginia. And he literally stood for hours a day in this posture, taking screws out of wood. And the railroad seemed to say that that, that had no relationship whatsoever to his back pain. <laughs> and they brought in a biomechanics expert and said there is no relationship to him standing like that for hours and hours and hours, days and days and days. Not to mention just standing like this, but then all the accelerations and the jostling and the things that happen in the course of, of doing your job. So it seems completely idiot proof, but it isn't when you get into a courtroom because of all that. So that's a whole area of forensic biomechanics that could be uh, pursued um, in either a degree program or maybe even some sort of certificate type program. But exercise physiology, there are things that we could do with basic medical sciences that, that get into some areas that would be favorable, not just to us, but maybe even to the medical school. Because they, they do some quasi exercise physiology, but they really don't do exercise physiology. And certainly, certainly psychological sorts of things as well. You know, 
I'm very familiar with sports psychology, but uh, industrial psych, you know, lots of opportunities there as well from a workplace perspective. Hey, thanks for doing this. Appreciate My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for showing up here. Uh, we'll have this recorded, uploaded uh, someplace. And so uh, appreciate uh, very much. Hey, nice job. That's pretty nice.